From a certain perspective, Brooks Falls is a cornucopia of plenty. It is the first place in Katmai National Park where salmon are available to bears. After a long winter of hibernation and a spring season with little nutritious food, bears feast at the falls to begin to regain their fat reserves. However, access to the falls and its salmon isn't guaranteed. Productive fishing spots are limited and a bear's hunger isn't easily sated. Combine that with the tail end of the bear's mating season, in which mating opportunities are very limited too, the setting is ripe for competition and conflict. Bears find a way to navigate these hurdles and survive in a world of limited resources in part through their system of dominance and hierarchy. Hi again, this is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. Joining me today is Naomi Boak, park ranger at Brooks Camp in Katmai National Park. Naomi, thanks so much for joining me again. And hierarchy and dominance are the topics of today's live chat. And it's an important one given the time of year Brooks River and the needs of the bears who gather here. So Naomi, can you uh, tell us uh, maybe to begin just about dominance and the concept of it and how does that fit into the bear world? Well, perhaps we lost Naomi there. So we will uh, stand by for just a moment. Okay, Naomi's working on her audio. So uh, she's in uh, remote Alaska. So uh, it's, it's kind of amazing that we are able to communicate with one another. There's still a lot of magic going on behind the scenes. Um, so sometimes these technical challenges happen and we'll, uh, we'll be patient for just a moment while we wait for her to, to fix her uh, audio. But simply, and we'll, I'll let uh, Naomi elaborate on this um, just a little bit more uh, when we get her back, but simply, you know, having, or dominance simply defined as having power and influence over, over others, um, you know, and we see that um, in the human world to a greater and lesser extent. We see it uh, very obviously in the bear world overall. And it, it, it is a system uh, for the bears that allows them to coexist really with one another somewhat peacefully, uh, given that they could be warring with one another all the time at the falls. But their system of dominance, the hierarchy that each one of these bears fits in, uh, helps them to uh, not only meet the challenges of living, but also do it in a manner that reduces uh, conflict between the animals. Although they, uh, but conflict is certainly uh, an important uh, part of their 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 lives. And while um, again, while we're waiting for Naomi, uh, you know, I wanted to maybe discuss what traits you can look for in uh, in bears that help you to understand what might define rank within the bear hierarchy. And it sounds like maybe we'll be getting Naomi back here uh, in, just, in just a moment. But when you're watching bears at Brooks Falls, make sure um, that you can, you can pay attention to a few different traits that'll really easily help you understand where bears fit into their, um, in, into their hierarchy. From the most dominant animals that gain the greatest access to food resources and other resources that, that they need to survive, to um, the lowest ranking bears, the subadults, and we'll discuss all of those bears in, and the ones in between as we move forward. So what, a couple of those traits that you can look for in bears just happens to be size. Maybe in that first and foremost, that is probably the most important trait that helps um, bears define, establish, and maintain their rank within the bear hierarchy. Size means a lot to bears. It's uh, if you're the, the bigger the bear, the easier it is for you to maintain um, your position 
uh, around food resources, the easier it is for you to intimidate other bears. And we see a lot of examples of this at, at Brooks Falls. And consequently, it's really not a surprise that the, the most dominant animals and happen to be the adult males because they are the biggest of bears as a size class. No other class of bear can physically compete with an adult male. At this time of the year, or approaching this time of the year, the average size of an adult male, a full grown adult male in Katmai is seven to 900 pounds. And the largest of our bears certainly approach or maybe even exceed a thousand pounds. And that is not an exaggeration. Uh, it's, I, I've actually revised my estimate upward over the past, um, few years uh, based on some new uh, new information and new evidence. In fact, last year, there was some laser scanning technology utilized on the bears uh, from, the, from the platform where the camera is positioned. And uh, through that, they were able to estimate that one bear, number 747, is uh, was maybe about 1,400 pounds last fall. So he is a giant of a bear. And he's an example of a bear that we've been seeing a lot over the past week and a half. Uh, at the falls um, and, and largely gaining access to the places that he needs very, very easily. So size is a, um, an important characteristic that helps bears, uh, you know, maintain their rank in the hierarchy because they do intimidate each other using their size. But there's another trait as well um, that combined with size can also help them to be become very dominant. And that happens to be disposition. Is the consistent has been consistently the most dominant bear at Brooks River over the last several or, or, or almost a decade, really. And he is, I think, maybe just a little bit smaller than um, than number seven four seven overall. Um, you know, he he stands um, just a bit, uh, you know, just as long and just as tall, maybe even a bit taller at the shoulders. But his disposition is much much different. Uh, than 747, and we'll try to get to that in just a little bit. Naomi, can you uh, can you hear me now? Um, I can I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Thanks for uh, uh, working through those those ah. issues. Um, <laughs> you sound great now. Um, I uh, was just uh, yeah. No, to I had to uh, I had to shut down. So where are you? I your audio is not great here for me. But um, where are we? <laughs> Well, I was just about to talk about um, dispositions in 856, but I want to back up just a little bit and give you an opportunity to introduce that concept of dominance to us once again, because I, I think you had a few more things to say about it than I did. Yeah, um, so if uh, you guys can hear me and we're back on again, it's Brooks and this happens. Um, so uh, dominance is a way of, um, controlling something or being more powerful, having more influence than another. Um, so um, with bears here at Brooks Falls, dominance and a system of hierarchy gives bears the ability to meet their objectives. And the objectives that they have here are to eat a year's worth of food, in a very short amount of time because they can't eat when they're hibernating and slowed down. And to do that by using the least amount of energy possible, which means they don't want to fight. You know, we think of, of brown bears as bears that want to fight. They, they don't want to fight. And um, they don't want to fight over fishing spots all the time. And the other thing is they want to reproduce. Now, that's those are the adult bears. The young bears are still trying to figure out their way in the world. So they're really, prior, their priorities are a little different. But um, when you see bears at Brooks Falls kind of move in and move out, you know, one bear will come in and another will leave the jacuzzi to make room for him. Or on the lip, you'll see a bear and all of a sudden he'll move away because another bear comes in. It's kind of like a ballet. And I call it the choreography of hierarchy because those bears establish in the beginning of the season who's more dominant than another. Um, it could carry over from season to season. Certainly 856's dominance carries over from one season to the next. But they know that if a bear who's more dominant than I am comes into the falls, 
I can't be there. I have to find enough, another fishing spot. And kind of the opposite of dominance and being lower down in the hierarchy is understanding that you are lower down in the hierarchy. And um, so you need to find other ways to make a living besides, um, uh, besides being in the jacuzzi or on the lip and those prime fishing spots. Now, while I was uh, incapacitated here, uh, Mike, uh, did you get into some of the characteristics that we see of dominance? Where do you want to go next? Yeah, I was discussing how bears have a, uh, their hierarchy is largely based on size, uh, but there is another trait that helps um, bears, you know, establish and maintain maybe a higher rank and punch above their weight otherwise. And that happens to be uh, their assertiveness. Uh, I was mentioning 856 when you came back. 856 has been consistently the most dominant bear along the river over the past year, or excuse me, over the past um, uh, year, certainly, but also over the last um, almost 10 years. So a very assertive bear, willing to get into the face of other bears, challenge other bears frequently. So he understands that he has influence over other bears, and that gives him a great many advantages when he's looking to access fishing spots uh, for example, and he is a, a much more um, uh, much more willing to challenge other bears than 747, even though 747 to me looks like, you know, the more massive bear. However, that assertiveness isn't just a, uh, a trait of very large adult males like 856. That assertiveness also plays a role in uh, the rank and the position uh, of female bears within the hierarchy. In Naomi, there's been one bear in particular that a lot of people are interested in watching this year because of her disposition, especially when she's caring for cubs like she is right now. Can you tell us a little bit about Grazer and uh, how her characteristics help her make a living in the world? Sure. Um, yeah, there, we don't talk enough about how uh, female bears have their own system of hierarchy and how they fit in with the male bears. And um, sows with cubs, definitely have a position in the hierarchy. Um, 128 Grazer, um, the last time she had cubs, uh, she was a really dominant bear on the river. She, uh, we even coined a phrase uh, to be grazered because if any bear came even close to her cubs, she would go and attack that bear. She would attack 856. She would attack 747. Those bears are at least twice her size. And um, now she came back with spring cubs this year. So we're wondering, will she be a little more mature and a little less nervous? I don't know. Um, I believe on the cam, some of you were watching the other night and she um, actually did run after another bear. So she is definitely a female to watch this year. I also um, am very interested in, always interested in 402, who um, is the most prolific female here. She's had seven litters, more than any other female bear here. And she is a dominant bear, especially when she has cubs. Um, she can dominate fishing on the lip. She even brings her, her cubs onto the lip. So um, there is a dominance and hierarchy among fe uh, females. Mike, how about uh, single females, females without club, cubs? What's their rank and dominance in the in the system here? Yeah, due to their uh, the defensiveness of mother bears, they tend to be you know they tend to just rank a little bit uh, lower than the adult males, and then come the the, the single females. Uh, and you know there was actually a question that came in through our bear cam question form earlier this week, and if you're interested in submitting more questions to that. Just find that form on in the more info tab um, below the live um, camera feed on the live chat channel. Just scroll down below and you'll be able to see it there, a link to it there. But George was asking, you know, when discussing the dominance hierarchy, it seems like, like you mentioned, Naomi, there's a lot of focus on the largest and most dominant male bears. What does the hierarchy and competition look like for those uh, smaller bears, um, like female bears? Do they have challenges like the larger bears? And they certainly do. But it's just a little bit harder for us to tease out you know, some of the individual um, 
ranks amongst that group of bears, amongst that, that group of single females for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is that they tend to be, as a class overall, single females tend to be more tolerant of one another than, um, than they do other classes of bears. So a female bear and even mother, uh, a, a female with, with cubs is more tolerant of other family, family groups than they would be an adult male or a, a young uh, sub-adult bear. So sometimes we don't see them interacting you know, aggressively as much as those other bears. And then the other reason why it's a little bit harder to tease out where these bears sort of sit in the hierarchy other than lower than the adult males is, is just because they're very dispersed along the river. They want to be at the falls because that presents the best fishing opportunities, especially in this season. But a lot of those females don't want to risk competing and endangering either themselves or their cubs around those uh, those big adults at the falls. So often, more often than not, they're displaced and relegated to less productive fishing spots downstream, whether that's the riffles or that happens to be the the lower Brooks River, uh, where you can watch on um, a river watch or a lower river camera feeds. So you can look there um, and a lot of see a lot more family groups using that area and single females using that area compared to what we do up at Brooks Falls. But Naomi, there's one more class of bear that we haven't talked about yet. And that happens to be the youngest of our bear or independent bears. And they really experience a lot of trials and tribulations to try to make their way through the world. And it's a, a difficult life for those subadults, especially within the ranks of the hierarchy. Yeah, um, subadults are definitely low bears on the totem pole. They um, they get moved out of every place they go, ex except for maybe some other subadults. Um, even cubs who are with sows rank higher than they are because they've got the protection of their mothers. Um, so subadults really have kind of a tough time finding their way in this world of Brooks Falls. Um, so, um, but they, but they learn a lot of things and they're learning a lot of things from birth. Um, you will see if you watch a uh, sow with cubs, you will see the cubs, um, vie for mother's milk, fight over fish. Those are skills they are learning about, um, how, about dominance and hierarchy. And you will see some cubs being more dominant than others, even within a litter. So uh, they learn that. And then as they get older and they um, become subadults, they kind of meet their buddies. They become a little social. And you'll see a lot of what we call play fighting. And sometimes I know if you're new to the cams, you might see a couple of young bears tussling. And you think, oh, my God, they're fighting. And you might worry about it. But not to worry, that's play fighting. And, um, and they're learning how to fight when they're older and actually need to protect themselves and find their place in, in the hierarchy. And uh, we've watched a number of bears uh, uh, do that kind of play fighting into uh, uh, young, young adulthood. So, um, Watch the subadults, how they change. Watch the cubs because they're learning a lot of things. Um, during an interaction, Mike, what what is it that we can expect a dominant bear and a submissive bear to do? I know we see a number of examples of that here on the river. What what exactly is happening? There are a number of behaviors that both a dominant bear and a submissive bear uh, will utilize or or display to communicate to the other bear that they're interacting with whether they are feeling you know worthy of of challenging the other bear whether they're feeling dominant or whether they're feeling submissive and we're going to get to a clip on that here in um in in just a, a moment because uh body posturing head position ear position all of those things are important characteristics now this is a an interaction between um 856 and number 68 that I recorded when I was at the river last year. 856 approached number 68. He's the one right in the, the center of the view right now standing up. He approached um, number 68 um, with a directed approach, actually with a short charge. He approached also with a directed stare, kept his 
uh, his head held relatively high, his ears pointed forward, and you can see number 68 there actually sat down for a period of time. This interaction went, actually went on for several minutes, so we're just sort of seeing the end of it right now. But number 68 didn't actually run away from this, uh, this instance. He, uh, he stood his ground maybe because he thought, and this is the, actually the, the beginning of it right here, so we'll uh, take a look at, at, at this. You can see that directed stare, that approach by 856 on the left, that short charge really gaining number 68's attention. You can see how number 856 is holding his head high in this instance, is um, higher at least than number 68. His ears are pointed forward. Number 68, again, with his, um, his head lower, his ears positioned back on his head like a defensive dog, indicating some submissiveness. Now this interaction wasn't over a fishing spot. So number 68 um, you know, thought better of running away. He didn't want to expose his hindquarters to attack by 856. When he sits down, he's demonstrating to 856 like he is right now. Hey, listen, big guy, I get the point. Why don't you just go and, and, and mouth off somewhere else? I'll just let you do what you need to do. Um, now, bears don't always sit down during these interactions between two big bears. A lot of times they just happen to avoid one another. One will just move away out of 856's way. But look for the ear position. Look for the head position overall. Um, of the dominant and submissive bears. You may be able to hear some vocalizations from time to time, sometimes on the cams. The, uh, the noise of the camera drowns that out, but occasionally you can, um, uh, you can hear that as well. And bears use their vocalizations to intimidate uh, the, the other, other bears uh, as well. Naomi, at the end of that instance, though, between number 856 and number 68, there was something that 856 did that indicated that he is uh, the more uh, dominant bear in that situation. Can you kind of explain what he did at the end of that clip and why it uh, demonstrates his dominance? Well, I, I couldn't see the clip here, but um, I can talk a little bit about what we see with 856 um, showing dominance. Sometimes he or a dominant bear will walk away from um, an encounter, um, a dominant encounter, and that means he's won because he's not afraid to show his backside. Uh, which is a more vulnerable position to the other bear. He said, I, you know, he's showing by doing that, I'm not afraid of you. Other times, that bear who's most dominant is, is looking to maintain a certain position, like the jacuzzi, which is a prime fishing spot. So that bear will, um, that bear will stay in place, not walk away. The other bear who is less dominant will have to back away. And I want to add one thing about reading bears' uh, body language and actions. A lot of times when we're talking about how to be safe when you're walking around Brooks camp, we will say, um, don't run, don't turn your back on a bear. And that's because in bear language, that means you're prey or you're submissive. So we're trying to translate bear language for humans so we don't give the wrong signals to those dominant bears. And, and the other thing about um, those signals that one thing you see with A56 is that he dominance is so important to him. He he does that at the beginning of every season. He he doesn't just take it for granted. Okay, you guys know I'm the most dominant bear. Bear just give a hint of being in the way. He'll take care of it. an example. I saw um, a couple of weeks ago. As uh, those that, for those of you who have been watching the cams, understand and have seen, 856 has been following Bear 402 for a week. He's in bear love. Uh, he wants to mate with her. Um, the, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, he was in the jacuzzi, 856 was in the jacuzzi at the falls, and 402 started to head towards the riffles. Well, in the riffles was bear 151 Walker, who is a much less dominant bear, much lower down in the hierarchy. And 151 had no interest in 402, but 856 ran from his 
prime fishing spot all the way down to the riffles to make sure that 151 understood that 402 was 856's female bear. So we see this in behavior all the time and, and um, look, look for it. It's uh, quite a drama, quite, quite, quite a show here. Um, any other tangible evidence that you have, Mike, of, uh, of bears sorting out hier hierarchy and dominance? I do actually, I have some statistics that I would like to share with everybody. And I've been waiting for years to actually share this uh, with the bear cam audience. Um, so I'm, I'm actually kind of excited about this. Uh, you know, we, like you mentioned, Naomi, 856 over the last week has been a uh, week and a half really following number 402, you know, looking to uh, perhaps copulate with her when the time is right, but he needs to maintain access to her. Uh, and when you when you watch number eight five six, um, even over like this past week, if you're new to bear cam or if you've been watching, and this is a clip of them in the lower river from last week, if you watch, uh, you know, if you've been watching for years, you see that eight five six does expend a lot of energy to maintain his rank at the top of the hierarchy, and uh, one of my naturalist projects when I'm at Brooks. Uh, river, and I won't be able to travel there this summer, uh, at least not in July due to the pandemic, unfortunately. But when I'm there, uh, I like to keep track of the interactions between bears that I see at the falls or when I'm out observing bears along the river. Uh, and I started doing this in 2011, and uh, and last year I took a lot more notes as as well. And when this uh, this winter, as part of finishing my book manuscript, uh, shameless plug for that, it'll be coming out later this year, I hope. Um, I uh, crunched the numbers on all of my different interactions that I that I witnessed. And with 856, there were some really interesting things that came out when I look at the numbers. 856, I uh, noted him interacting with other bears uh, in 575 instances. And of those instances, he was the, the quote unquote winner in 573 instances. Now there's a couple of caveats that I want everyone to consider when you're uh, hearing those statistics, because um, I didn't take notes in 2011, although all the rangers who worked there during that summer said A56 was very dominant at that time and didn't yield to anyone. And I also didn't take uh, notes in 2017 in July because I wasn't able to travel at Brooks River uh, in, the, um, in July of 2017. 2017 in particular would have uh, skewed the numbers just a little bit, just because um, 856 didn't arrive until very late. And he was also, he also appeared injured at that time. And he, he did yield to some of the big males at the falls during that year. So I, I didn't include those statistics because I hadn't observed those things um, personally. But overall, the, in, the statistics still illustrate that 856 is an extremely dominant bear. Uh, and perhaps even more telling than, you know, the total number of actual wins that he had is the, the way he went about it. Because in about half of those interactions, 279 interactions out of that 575, he won the interaction because the bears simply avoided him. They saw him coming from a distance and they just got out of the way. So he didn't really have to expend any extra energy except the energy of walking to like his fishing spot or wherever else it happened to be that he, that he wanted. So his reputation did precede him when he was able to, um, after he was able to establish his dominance over all of the other bears at, at Brooks River. There are some, a couple of other, um, one other note that I wanna talk um, about before I transition you back to you, Naomi, and that happens to be, uh, what, what about the other bears at the river? And just one other example that I'll provide from my statistics happens to be number 480 Otis. Uh, you know, he was a bear that just engaged other bears uh, far less than 856. Uh, he, I noted him only interacting with other bears on 139 uh, occasions, and he was a loser in about 80 of those, which indicates to me that he was trying to find a different way of making a living. You mentioned it before, there's just not one way of making a living. If you're not the most dominant bear, hey, you're going to try to find a niche at the falls any way that you can. So whether that's alternative fishing uh, locations, alternative fishing times, there are a lot of different ways that bears can make a living. And Otis is an older bear right now. He's in his mid-20s doesn't have the body mass and the, or the strength to compete with um, 
the likes of A56 and 747, but he's still able to make a living using those alternative fishing strategies. So, you know, as we come up on our conclusion here, Naomi, um, you know, I encourage everyone uh, to make their own observations about the hierarchy at the river. And I know you'll keep us informed, um, but Naomi, the, the, the hierarchy and dominance is so intertwined with much of the bear's existence um, that it's just a fascinating process to watch. And I know you had a few more words to say about that. Yeah, um, well, I think we talk about how intertwined the ecosystem is here along the Brooks River. Um, the, the large salmon run that brings this high concentration of brown bears here every year, um, the, the birds who feed off the discards that the, the um, bears leave, and the, even the, the salmon DNA that's found in the flora here. And part of this complex ecosystem is the system of hierarchy and dominance, because in order to be able to take advantage of this amazing salmon run, and be around each other and get and for the bears to get fat they need this system of hierarchy it enables them to eat more and move less expend fewer calories take in more and be successful and also be successful and thrive in terms of mating and procreating and getting more bear bears around here so this is all this is a complex, lovely, as I call it, ballet of hierarchy um, is part of how bears survive and thrive here on the Brooks River. And um, Mike and I just wanted to thank you for joining us today on explore.org, um, which is uh, bring, does this amazing feat of bringing you the bear cams. And um, even though my audio fails occasionally, um, the brilliant texts help us out and we get back to you. So um, Mike, were there um, any questions that you wanted to take uh, here at the end um, or are we out of time? I think we have time for a few of these questions if we are succinct about it. Uh, these are uh, questions that came in again through our bear cam, uh, our ask your bear cam question. Uh, form and find again find the link to that below the live cam feed on the left side of the page if you want to submit questions in advance. Uh, uh, one of the questions that came up uh, uh, regarding dominance and hierarchy uh, came from Joanne and she was actually asking why would 856 break up a spat between 747 and number 83? Did the interaction negate his dominance status or, or was he just drawn to a good fight? And Naomi, we talked about this um, earlier today. You said you hadn't witnessed that interaction. So maybe I'll, I'll take this one because I saw um, a replay of it. And what happened is uh, 747 got in uh, 83's face and we didn't introduce 83 during the chat, but he's another large adult male, uh, but subordinate to 747. 747 got in his face and then uh, number 856 saw those two bears interacting and took it as an opportunity to assert his dominance over both of those animals. So he wasn't really breaking up the uh, interaction between those two bears. I think he was just looking uh, and saw an opportunity to assert his dominance over both of those bears. So that is my uh, my take on that, that situation. Uh, A56 seems to do that uh, every once in a while. He just doesn't like other bears asserting themselves too much in his, in his presence. Another question, Naomi, though, um, comes from <laughs> Odie. Um, and that person asks, uh, at first I didn't recognize 747 because he has a wonky left ear. Other people in the chat seem familiar with this, but I did, hadn't noticed it before. Do you know how and when he got this wonky ear? Um, well, we didn't see him get his wonky ear. He kind of arrived uh, at the falls with it. Um, there are some hypotheses we can have. He could have gotten into a fight. Um, bears tend to grab at the uh, neck and ears. And we've seen in the past, we saw Lurch who actually lost an ear um, in a fight. Um, and 747 did come with some fresh wounds. Uh, so did 856. Uh, 
And more recently, we've, we've seen even more fresh wounds. Or it could be like Otis or Scaredy Bear, um, who both have wonky ears and could be genetic. So we're not quite sure because we don't see that action. So Mike, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Okay, yeah, well, you know, we, we know a lot about what the bears are doing when they're on the river, but we don't know a lot about what they're doing uh, when they're away from the river. <laughs> We can make some assumptions about that, of course, um, but there's there's just a, a that's a, a, mis a relatively mysterious part of their life. So who knows? Um, you know, Naomi, you have some great ideas about how uh, 747 could have got that wonky ear. Another question, though, um, and I think this does have a simple answer, but Naomi, I think you and I both have a more complicated answer for this. Um, but Pam asks, do bears pee in the water? I couldn't quite hear that, Mike. Do bears? Oh, okay. <laughs> do, they, do bears pee in the water? And and yes, they do. Uh, um, but I wanted to uh, also, you know, discuss whether um, you know how how urination and scent marking actually works their way into the hierarchy. Um, a lot of times, when you see bears posturing on on land, especially the big adult males, they will walk with a very stiff legged gait. Uh, with their hind legs and that's called a cowboy walk and when they're doing that they're grinding their foot pads into the ground leaving scent behind there they're also urinating all over the place urinating on their feet on their legs uh, so that um, when they do urinate that happens to uh, uh, that happens to lay scent down and communicate messages that we don't really necessarily understand but probably tells other bears about what sex uh, of the bear that that mark and also which um, uh, and 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 its relative like fitness or dominance status. So yeah, they they certainly will urinate pretty much anywhere, including in the river. Um, but uh, that urine also plays a very important role in communicating certain things um, among males and and females. Uh, the the next question, Naomi, maybe I'll throw back to you. Uh, how much? And this comes from George. He asks, how much does the dominance hierarchy determine which male bears mate? in a given season. Mike, your your audio is very difficult for me to hear, so I think you're going to have to handle these questions. Okay. I can't I can't all right, understand well, the question. Okay. Sorry. Okay, I think it's that's all right. audio. <laughs> that, you know, yeah, it's a it's a challenging instance, but um, uh, we work with it either way. Uh, I'll try to get through a couple of these quickly. Um, to just conclude conclude the chat. And I really do want to thank Naomi in advance if she's not able to, to rejoin us towards the end. Um, and, and being such a stalwart and working um, at Epps River this summer during some challenging conditions to say the least. Uh, but getting back to George, George's question, uh, there is evidence that older and more dominant bears happen to um, sire more offspring from other ecosystems. Um, I know on the Arctic Slope, there was one study from the 1990s that, uh, that demonstrated that. Um, at Brooks River, we don't really know for sure, but we have a good idea that, yeah, if you are a big dominant male, you're probably able um, to, to sire more offspring. That's not to mean that younger bears le um, and less dominant bears don't have that opportunity because sometimes bears just happen to come together at the right place in the right time and, and copulate. That certainly happens. Um, but some limited genetic um, analysis of the bears at Brooks River that happened in um, from 2005 to 2007, I believe, found that um, of 14 parental, um, 14 parental assignments, so to speak, of cubs at Brooks River, uh, those were all assigned to just four uh, adult um, males. And those were probably the most dominant bears in the area at that time. At least three of them were. One was an unidentified bear that we, we didn't see at the river during those years. But certainly if you're an older bear uh, with uh, who's also able to maintain that level of dominance, then I, I think you're able to have more frequent mating opportunities. The second part of George's question, though, is what role does female choice play in mating? Oftentimes, females don't have much of a choice. It does seem like occasionally they like to, uh, or they prefer one male bear over another, but usually it's the dominant male that makes that makes the choice for them. 
um, like a, a bear, like A56. If 4002, for instance, prefers um, another male, then um, then she doesn't really have that opportunity to express that choice just because of A56's dominance and following her. And Naomi, I'll try this uh, one last question with you. Um, maybe you'll be able to hear uh, this one, um, but let me know if you cannot. Um, EJ asks, if a large male bear is more tolerant of the presence of humans, does that impact his level of dominance? It's, okay, I, again, your audio is tough. What impacts his 856's level of dominance? Is that what you're asking? Or any bear? Any bear overall. If um, does that, uh, what about human? the human presence in the area? Does that um, impact the level of dominance of a habituated bear? Um, I'm not sure that it impacts the level of dominance. It certainly impacts um, interaction. Um, I think that certain bears, for instance, um, even if they're less dominant, are a little more used to humans. Um, and, um, and so that makes it easier for them to uh, thrive around here because there are humans around um uh but I, I think that um a lot of the dominant bears here um i think they just feel dominant i i talked to one of the bear techs yesterday and he said we never haze 856 856 knows the king of everything and um that goes for humans too whereas they will haze other bears out of camp a56, he gets his way. So um, there is some effect on human bear interaction, but maybe more on the humans than on the bears. All right, well, uh, that's the end of our questions for, for now. Naomi, thanks once again for joining me today. Uh, I think we're gonna sign off here in, in, in just a second, but um, tune in for Bear Cam. There's a lot of other live events coming up later this summer. Uh, in fact, on Friday, uh, Ranger Brooklyn and myself are in the Bear Cam comments on the same page from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time to answer your questions in that Q&A and, and ask us, it's basically ask us anything during that time. Um, but Naomi, thanks once again for joining me today. It was great to speak with you. My name is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org. Thanks for watching us today and uh, live long and prosper during these challenging times.